What if we could bring back the woolly mammoth? What would it mean for conservation, for the planet, for the places that it used to inhabit? What if extinction didn't have to be forever? Now, I'm not talking about this, believe me, I wish, but it is a question that some scientists have been trying to answer for decades and a couple are getting close. Harvard geneticist George Church is one of the closest because he's not trying to clone the mammoth genome, he's trying to edit the genome of their closest living relative, the Asian elephant. He's confident he can tweak a few genes using CRISPR to create an elephant with cold climate adaptations, like greater hair coverage, altered fat distribution, and smaller ears to create a mammoth. Well, not really a mammoth, it would still be an Asian elephant, just a fuzzy one. A discount mammoth. But it's not just for the sake of bringing them back, it's with a grander aim. You see, so much of the public imagination has been taken up with bringing back species from extinction, but there's a bigger, far more important question that scientists are seriously considering. What if we could bring back extinct ecosystems? In northeastern Siberia, the land is covered in large forests. Now this habitat is young, only springing up in the last 10,000 or so years. That's young for this kind of landscape, bear with me. Or not, again, very little living in these forests. Before the forest, the land was dominated by grass. So why was there once grassland where there isn't any now? Simply put, there's no longer any mammoths. You see, during the last ice age, most of the world was populated by large megafauna that shaped the very biomes they inhabited. The most famous example of this is the woolly mammoth, which ranged across Eurasia and into North America, across a massive globe-straddling habitat called the Mammoth Steppe. This habitat was very similar to the savannas of Africa, but where the savanna is hot and dry, the Mammoth Steppe was cold and dry. They had other similarities too, like the savanna, the sweeping grasslands of the steppe were maintained by large grazing herbivores. Mammoth, yes, but also antelope, deer, caribou, horses, bison, and woolly rhinos. As the Ice Age came to an end, the climate shifted from cool and dry to warmer and more humid, a climate that favoured mossy forest, tundra and wetlands over grassland. It's likely that this change in climate and habitat coupled with pressure from human predation put a strain on all these large herbivore populations, restricting their range or in some cases driving them to extinction. As the herbivores began to disappear, the shrinking grassland had nothing to defend it against the encroaching forests and eventually what had been a massive globe-spanning habitat was all but gone. But in Yakusha, in the far north of Siberia, the mammoth steppe is making a comeback. Amid the vast forest lies a stretch of grassland inhabited by large herbivores, some of which haven't naturally occurred there for thousands of years. You'll just be walking through the forest and suddenly you're seeing reindeer, you've got bison, you've got musk ox, horses, yaks, sheep, you'll even see camels. They were all placed there by Sergei and Nikita Zimov, who for decades have been running an experiment to see if large herbivores that once dominated the Ice Age landscape could be used to bring back the mammoth steppe. His plan has proved pretty effective so far. The reduction in decaying plant matter and the constant overturning of soil and snow has even cooled the permafrost in the area by a couple of degrees, slowing the rate of melt. But with the help of George Church, he wants to reintroduce the woolly mammoth to its ancestral homeland. Pleistocene Park's Kickstarter page describes the project as the world's best plan to bring back a vanished Ice Age ecosystem and save the world from a catastrophic global warming feedback loop. Restoration of degraded habitats through reintroduction of the species that have been driven out is called rewilding. This particular brand of Ice Age ecosystem restoration is called Pleistocene rewilding. It's based on the idea that ecosystems can be restored by bringing back animals that live there in the Pleistocene era, not just extinct animals like mammoths, but extant ones as well, either because they used to live in that area or they're close enough analogues to what did live there. Rewilding doesn't have to be that dramatic though. The most popular kind of rewilding, called trophic rewilding, is about reintroducing animals that play an important role in the food chain so that natural ecosystem interactions can be restored. And ideally the ecosystem becomes self-sustaining so that human management and intervention is minimised. It can involve reintroducing animals that have been gone for thousands of years or for a few decades. Like the restoration of Portugal's Greater Coa Valley, which was an overgrazed, fire-scorched landscape so degraded that farmers were leaving the area en masse. The organisation Rewilding Europe decided to take advantage of all the empty land to try something out. It started in the Fire Brava Nature Reserve with the reintroduction of wild cattle and horses. Suddenly, this land that was ravaged by wildfires wasn't seeing the same fire frequency and plant life was recovering even as the new herbivores grazed it. This new plant life provided habitat for small prey animals and the carnivores soon followed. As the land became populated once again with Iberian lynx and various eagle species, the scavengers like vultures also 
are returned. Trophic rewilding can also be focused on a single species. In fact, the original concept of trophic rewilding was just about reintroducing apex predators into an environment to implement top-down control. No, not that kind of top-down control, more, um, yeah, that. The concept of top-down control can be best explained by looking at a trophic pyramid. Don't worry, it's not a multi-level marketing thing. It's a method of visualising the transfer of energy in a food chain. The autotrophs, or primary producers, convert sunlight into energy, and every other level, the heterotrophs, consume that energy. The level above the autotrophs are the primary consumers. They only get 10% of the energy the autotrophs hold. Similarly, the things that eat them, the secondary consumers, only get 10% of the energy the primary consumers gain. And tertiary consumers only get 10% of that, and so on. So it's a pyramid, because as we move up, less and less energy is being transferred. Now, if we remove the apex predator, up the top here, there's nothing to control the population of the consumers directly below it, and their population might explode, causing a depletion of the resources below them, and making it so that there's not enough energy in the lower levels to sustain the upper levels. A change in one level affects all the other levels in a process known as a trophic cascade. If we return the predator, some of these guys get eaten, these populations recover, and control is restored from the top down. But this is a simplified view of how ecosystems work. For for example, it doesn't account for animals that might replace the apex predator or that prey animals might cope with their increased population by seeking more diverse food sources or even out-competing other animals they share food sources with. Think of a food web. There's all kinds of connections going on here, all kinds of give and take. If a few species disappear, others that relied on them also vanish, some that were suppressed become more prominent, maybe some other species move in to fill these empty niches, and the structure of the whole web changes. This is part of why trophic rewilding has been described as a Pandora's box. In a real ecosystem with all kinds of interactions, it's hard to predict what might happen if an animal is reintroduced to an ecosystem or landscape that has changed in its absence. The most famous example of this is probably the wolves of yellow Stone. You see, wolves, much like mammoths, are what we call a keystone species. They're organisms that, through their activities, help to define the ecosystem they live in. An important thing to note is that a keystone species, predator or not, has low functional redundancy. If one were to disappear from its ecosystem, no other species would be able to effectively fill its niche. We've all seen the video about how wolves change rivers. You know, the one that was shown in every high school bio class about how drastically the park changed after wolves were reintroduced to control the elk population. And if you didn't see it there, it's probably been spat at you by the Facebook algorithm at some point. That video is a great introduction to the concept of trophic rewilding, the idea that an ecosystem can be restored through reintroduction. But it also exemplifies some of the issues with rewilding as a base concept. The clip doesn't tell the full story of why the park changed so drastically and how it got to be in that state in the first place. Yellowstone is an incredibly complex ecosystem and whenever an ecosystem changes it's important to understand all of the factors that interact and come into play to make that change. The return of the wolves happened to coincide with a rough patch for the elk. A particularly bad drought had thinned out their population and low native trout numbers meant that animals that usually ate trout, like bears, were relying more on the deer for food. They were also being preyed on by other predators like cougars, so the elk were being hit from multiple sides. And the wolves' presence, while beneficial, didn't actually fix the ecosystem completely. As wonderful as wolves are, there isn't much that they can do to address the problem of invasive fish in the waterways of Yellowstone. As Yale ecologist Oswald Schmidt says, predators can be important, but they aren't a panacea. Some might still argue, well, okay, the park wasn't restored by wolves alone, but it was the absence of wolves that got the park to be in that state in the first place. The wolves being gone is what led to the oversized deer population, which is what led to the overgrazed land, right? Well, not quite. To better understand why Yellowstone was an unbalanced ecosystem, we need to go back to when the park was founded. In 1872, Ulysses S. Grant signed 2.2 million acres of land spanning parts of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming into Yellowstone National Park. The official reason for establishing the park was to protect the scenic wonders and wildlife from hunters, prospectors, loggers, and settlers, with a long-term goal of encouraging tourism to the area. But the land that was cordoned off was part of the ancestral homelands of multiple First Nations groups, who managed the ecosystem through hunting, harvesting, and controlled burns. Suddenly, 
suddenly all these people were being forced to leave an important part of their homeland by the US Army, supposedly in the name of conservation. But as anthropologist Matthew Sanger says, creating a massive park in tribal lands was a distinct political act, and it happened under a president who was fervently against native peoples. First Nations people were permitted to continue hunting and gathering in the park under the Fort Lamari and Fort Bridges treaties. Captain Moses Harris, who became the park's first military superintendent in 1886, didn't recognise this. First Nations land management was further suppressed in 1894, when the Lacey Act put a blanket ban on hunting in park boundaries. The US Cavalry patrolled the park to prevent First Nations people from returning to the ancestral sites they'd been forced out of. Conflict with the rightful custodians came with bad press, which was scaring tourists away. So at the same time that patrols were keeping First Nations people out and a predator control program was decimating wolf numbers in the park, marketing campaigns were launched to erase the history of the tribes in Yellowstone. Marketing campaigns that, in some ways, are still in effect to this day. The official brochure for Yellowstone National Park says, when you watch animals in Yellowstone, you glimpse the world as it was before humans. Shane Doyle, a research associate at Montana State University and a member of the Absolute Nation, puts it pretty neatly, saying, the park is a slap in the face to native people. When the Lacey Act came into effect, the continued right of First Nations people to live off the land was no longer honoured, and throughout the 20th century, the elk population increased exponentially. Ecosystem interactions didn't just break down because wolves were gone, they deteriorated because another vital part of the ecosystem, people, had been forced to leave. When the wolves returned, they might have helped change the landscape, but it was people, past and present, that shaped it. The story of Yellowstone is an important one because it's emblematic of one of the issues with the original concept of rewilding. The idea of restoring a pristine wilderness free of human intervention comes from a Western ideal of humans as separate from nature, rather than as a part of it. This idea of separation started first as a view of humanity as something above nature and has more recently evolved to view humanity as a destroyer of nature, or a pestilence. The truth is, the untouched Yellowstone wilderness of our imagination never really existed. The very roads around and through Yellowstone were originally First Nations trails. In the words of Mark David Spence, uninhabited wilderness had to first be created. So wilderness is a concept that erases the people who have been successfully and sustainably living off the land for thousands of years. All over the world, indigenous land rights have been ignored and communities have faced displacement and violence in the name of creating sustainable wilderness and infrastructure without their input or consent. In more recent years, the environmental movement has started to embrace intersectionality, and our understanding of ecological restoration has grown to include an acknowledgement of the need to protect human livelihoods and of the importance of restoring Indigenous leadership and land rights. Last year, Chief Edwin Ogar, alongside his co-authors, published a review of some modern rewilding and ecosystem restoration projects led by Indigenous groups. In the Arctic, the once degraded and resource-poor Vanishjoki River was restored to its former glory as an important habitat for a variety of coldwater fish when the Skolt Sami people were able to revert the damage done by man-made alterations to the river. By utilising long-held indigenous knowledge, they could restore the landscape to a state that supports its own ecosystem that is resource-rich, a state that we might call wild despite the fact that it's not a state that could exist without human management and intervention. In West Africa, unsustainable timber harvesting has degraded much of the rainforest which once dominated the landscape. Private companies, government bodies and illegal harvesters continue to chip away at most of it, but in the Cross River state of Nigeria there exists a thriving 33,600 hectare patch of intact forest. Look at this untouched forest. This is what happens when we leave the planet alone and keep our evil human hands away from nature. Except it's not untouched. The Akuri community have been managing this forest since 1982 and it's arguably the most healthy forest in West Africa. Because it's operated by the community rather than outside forces, it isn't subject to over-harvesting, with logging only allowed for domestic uses rather than for export or sale. Farming is limited to approved farming zones, water pollution is banned, and any proceeds from logging are used to benefit the community by contributing to healthcare, infrastructure and education. Management of the forest by the people who live in it mean that it's 
it's not only used, it's valued and protected, and so is all the wildlife that lives in it. In the US, scientists collaborated with the Lower Elwha tribe to remove two hydropower stations on the Elwha River. This collaboration with Indigenous peoples, rather than railroading conservation solutions, has resulted in the rapid restoration of the ecosystem. Already, birds, Pacific salmon, and other species have returned to the region. In Australia, the East Trinity wetland had become highly acidic after a sugarcane plantation dried out the soil. Normal remediation methods for this would have involved stripping most of the land's vegetation, but with the help of indigenous land and sea country ranges of Jambunti, ecologists were able to address the acidity without damaging the landscape, and native mangrove trees are now growing, attracting back fish, reptiles and birds. Likewise, elsewhere, rewilding has become a collaboration between people that need to use the land for financial security and those that want to see the ecosystem restored to its former glory. In Great Britain, Derek Gow has transitioned his farm to a wildlife sanctuary where he breeds animals that have become endangered or extinct in Britain and then releases them. Sometimes it's above board, sometimes it's not, but he's one of the people responsible for reintroducing the beaver to Britain. Ecologists and farmers can sometimes come into conflict. Rewilding might involve restoring land that farmers used to rely on or releasing predators that scare or attack livestock. Because he started out tending livestock, Derek is able to offer a more rounded perspective. His goal isn't just to help the environment, but also to help farmers. He's become a major proponent for plans to pay British farmers to keep and breed wildlife and plant life on their land for subsequent release in rewilding projects. He sees it as a way to help farmers financially recover from Brexit, while promoting sustainable farming practices that can coexist with a wilder Britain. The great success of the Coa Valley wasn't just the restoration of the landscape, it was also the restoration of the community. The newly thriving ecosystem created a thriving economy with the establishment of ecotourism businesses. Via Brava was so successful that rewilding efforts were expanded to the whole valley, and as it did, people were finally also able to make a living off of the regenerated land. When Pleistocene Park was originally founded, it was simply an experiment to see if herbivores could restore and maintain the mammoth steppe, but since then, it's also become a source of income for local indigenous communities, as the park purchases livestock like reindeer from indigenous herders to bolster park populations. Not only that, but the slowed rate of permafrost melt within the park's boundaries has brought attention to the global melting of permafrost, an issue that's destroying the towns and homes of indigenous peoples living throughout the Arctic Circle. Rewilding has proved an important tool in the arsenal of conservation, but it's important that it evolves alongside social progress. The indigenous organisation Kararak published a letter recently recently calling for the repositioning of conservation agendas so that they can be more inclusive towards indigenous and local communities through knowledge sovereignty and altering how research prioritisation and funding is determined and by whom. We're still a part of nature, even our cities are ecosystems, harsh, hostile to everything that's not a person or a pet, but still ecosystems. And the sooner we can acknowledge that we all belong in this web as well, the sooner we can work to make our landscapes more habitable for wildlife and humans alike.